Okay. Welcome, Edla, to the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. How are you, Elizabeth? It's so good to see you. Great to see you. I'm excited to get to talk to you today, but we always kick off our show with a little bit of words and, and inspiration from what I call the Happy Healthy Caregiver Jar. Um, okay. So let's see what, oops, what, what's got in store here for you today? Okie doke. It says, sometimes I need to go off on my own. I'm not sad. I'm not angry. I'm just recharging my batteries. Yes. <laughs> Are you going to know what I think about that? Yeah. What, is, what think, does that make oh, you think of? No, I think about that. Well, as a caregiver, um, I think so much of the time to regulate my emotions um, I think it's so important for us to just take a minute by ourselves. And it doesn't mean that um, well, we might be angry or we might be sad, but I think it's just a matter of being with our thoughts, having a minute to sort of regulate our nervous system so that we can continue to do this work for, you know, for our loved ones or our family or our clients or whoever we're working with. So yeah, yeah it's a lot. Did you have a place that you would go to your retreat? to retreat and kind of do, do this? Well, yeah, well, there's multiple places. It sort of depends where I am, right? So in my house, certainly it's up in my bedroom or I have a great walking area that I can go in our neighborhood. So I would do, that was probably the most common, but you know, I'm really big on being proactive about kind of those things. So when I'm working with other people or with, even with myself, when I'm going to the beach or going anywhere, I've always got my safe place, right? I always mm. sort of pre-plan, where is my safe place going to be? And then I'll talk to my clients about that. You know, if you're going on vacation, where's your safe place going to be? So you can have a minute to just get away and recharge. And, and you know, I think it's really a positive thing. Uh, it's a healthy that. thing. Yeah. Sometimes it's the bathroom, right? Like you can. Well, yeah. The ba yeah. Cause not many people say anything to you and go to the bathroom. <laughs> no, it's, and it's, yeah. Unless my dogs are following me. I and that's tell usually. People, though, when they, you know, when you, you go to the bathroom, that when you're in there to be really intentional, right? So it might be looking in the mirror and telling yourself, I've got this or you know positive affirmations or just mm. in there just being really intentional about taking some deep breaths not just going to the bathroom or really yeah. any safe place being intentional with um what you're doing when you're in those quiet places yes I love that well we've got to get to know you a little bit Edla so yeah. share a little bit about your caregiving journey with us okay um, so I was my parents' caretaker for over 10 years. Um, first, it was with my dad, and I guess I was really a co-caretaker because my mom and I both were, um, you know, working sure. through that process, <laughs> you know, to kind of support him. Um, and then I was my mother's caretaker for seven or eight years, just myself. And I always... I always say caretaker, but I think, um, you know, there's always a caveat because so many people don't live near their loved ones. And then some people don't live with their loved ones. I was I always felt like I was really more of my mother's care manager because I did not live in the home with her. You know, like I wasn't bathing her and feeding her and doing those sorts of things. I was more of the financial caretaker and the emotional caretaker and the logistical mm -hmm. caretaker. And I think that's um, a good way to put it. You're, you're mm -hmm. managing a lot of different pieces. Yeah. I often felt like it's a, it's almost like an emotional project manager. Like you, you've oh. got this emotional element. So it's not just like work where you're managing projects, but it's got that other, other layer in it. Well, that's, that gives us a sense of, of who you are. Um, looking back in hindsight on your caregiving journey with your with your parents, like, what do you wish you maybe knew sooner? Um, wow. <laughs> so many things. I think with my dad, well, okay. One thing I wish I'd known sooner was just sort of typical development of the aging population. What are sort of the standard things? And I think I've told you this before, but like, 
when you have a kid, you know, you'll read about what to expect when mm. you're expecting or when they're one or people will read about two or three year old development, but they don't really read about development in the aging population. And there's different, you know, traits that happen. And so I didn't know some of the things that my dad was doing was quote unquote normal for an aging person, but I did not know that. So that's probably one of the things. What was like one of those things that you were told? Just like, um, I mean, it feels kind of obvious now, but just sort of reducing his circle, like his social circle. And that's a real common thing that happens. And, you know, there's different reasons for that. It could be changes in their sensory, um, could be sensory decline in their hearing and vision, um, you know, yep. just all of that. And and I didn't know very much about the specifics of how the senses decline as you age and how that can impact behavior. So yeah, good point. I, yeah, I wish I had known a little bit more like that. I don't know. I felt just really looking back, I felt like I was naive. I was like, you know, it's just not going to be a big deal. I'll just take care of them and it'll be <laughs> fine. Yeah. You know. Until you learn all the new terms and all the uh, new yeah. things and, yeah. and you do feel like you get your master's in, yeah. in caregiving then, that but way. The, but the other thing that's tricky too, is that their temperaments, like when I think about mom and dad, both at the same time, my mother's temperament and my dad's temperament were so different that it's almost like I needed different skills when I was dealing with mom versus dealing with dad. And I think that's an important part of caretaking too. Some are easier to care for and some are more challenging. And you had to try them on. I'm sure it didn't come to you like overnight. Like what, give us an example of some of the different things that you had to do that were different for mom and dad. Okay. So my dad, for example, I couldn't tell him what to do. I had to like give him a couple of, um, I wonder if you think blah, 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 dad, you know, I'd kind of throw it out there like that. And then I'd give him a couple of choices. One thing comes to mind was he, he got to where he'd stopped bathing. And mm. so I had to, and he just refused to do it. Right. Where my mother was more of an anxious um, person and she was always trying to fix the problem and solve the problem. And that was challenging because your eyes aren't getting any better, mom. There's not anything else to do, right? But that's not what she wanted to hear. So where dad just was like, I'm not going to worry about any of this. I'm just going to let nature take its course. And then mom, on the other hand, was like, we need to fix this. I've got to get my eyes fixed and my this fixed and my that fixed. And I'm like, you're 85. I don't think there's, you know. Some of it's an accept thing. How did you get dad to shower, by the way? Well, I didn't get him to shower. My mother, well, this is a little bit of a story. My mother, I was at work and she just was relentless calling me, trying to get me to get my dad to do what she wanted him to do. It, it was, it was, she was persistent. Well, <laughs> I went in and so my dad, um, I went over there and, and my dad, he just thought he wasn't dirty. And that was another developmental thing. They think they're not dirty because they haven't done anything, Right. But they also are sometimes too proud to admit that the shower is scary for them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I did was I went in their bathroom and I kind of looked at their bathroom from his perspective. And of course, now I'm like, there were the slip rugs. There was no handle to hold on to. He had to step over into the tub. There was not a slip mat in the bottom, right? There were all these things. So I was like, and he does not have the temperament to say, I feel like I'm, it's, I need set. this. Yeah. yeah. And so what I did was I was like, you know, dad, you've been out in the garden all day and it's kind of hot. So you're sweaty. So you need to um, take a bath today. I said, if you don't want to take a shower, you can at least take a bird bath. I said, which do you think you'll want to do? And he said, um, he'd take a bird bath. Well, that was a huge clue. My father had never taken a bird bath in his life. Right. So I went in there and I got it kind of set up and um, I don't know if he took a bird bath or not. I didn't stay in there with him, but that's what then clued me in to go upstairs and look. And then we made some modifications in the home, but he still yeah. was a little bit hard headed about. You're you like know, a detective. Yes, you definitely. 
it's for, one of your roles. I mean, and you I, had to kind of, you knew though, what was normal behavior for your parents. And I so did. that mm -hmm. to your point, like something triggered and it's like, okay, this, this isn't how they've always been. So, you know, what has changed? And so good for you for kind of checking that into that. Um, it sounds like you had to do a lot of mediating between the two. And I, you oh, know, have been there. So much, so much mediating. You know, I always laugh. I said, it's a good thing I'm a therapist, right? Because <laughs> I have a lot of skills, you know, that I use and that I, you Yeah, know. talk about that a little bit. Like, did you find some of your professional training, you know, as a parent counselor is where yes. you focus for, yep. for parents of young children. Did that translate into helping you with caring for aging parents? So much, so, so much. So just to give your listeners a little background, I, one of the jobs that I had when my dad was, we were caring for my dad was I, I was a parent counselor for um, parents of children in the birth through kindergarten population. So these parents would come in, their kids weren't sleeping or, you know, their kids were wearing all these crazy outfits or the kids wouldn't eat whatever. And so I would give them, you know, recommendations and we'd talk about how to get their kids to be more cooperative. And so it was actually that bath conversation was like, this is like dealing with a toddler. And so I certainly not in a, you know, discouraging yeah. or, or, you know, <laughs> um, way, but I would use some similar strategies with modifications um, to make my parents be more cooperative and to be more willing to consider some things. And it, it was really helpful. I mean, I didn't want to belittle them or, you know, I didn't want to say sure. like that, but, but with some modifications, I was able to use some of the same strategies with mom and dad that I, you know, used to teach them. You yet. mentioned one, which was the giving him choices, like, right, a, you know, exactly. are the, what are some of the other strategies that some people uh, might want to try on? Well, the biggest one, and I, and I have a um, workbook that's a free thing. It's on my website. I'll tell you about that in a minute, but yeah, I'd we'll say, link to it. We'll link to it, Edla, in the sure, show sure. notes. But one of the biggest things, and I think this is true for everyone, people want to be heard and understood, right? Yeah. If you, if you feel like somebody understands what you're saying, whether or not you agree with it, if somebody just takes a minute to feel like they're being heard, then when you have to problem solve, you've got a better chance of them participating with you. So my mother was much more, I use this much more my mother because she was a, um, a pretty anxious person and, um, you know, just much more of an emotional person, let's just say. And so I would always lead the conversation with something like, well, mom, I can tell you're really worried about that. Or it's really frustrating that he won't take a bath or you're not, you're worried that you're not going to have enough money or whatever, you know, the crisis of the day was, I just, kind of reflected back what she was saying in an empathic tone of voice and it that settled her down and once it settled her I'm giving you the quick version of this but once it settled settled down a little bit then I was able to problem solve with her or she was able to come up with you know a more realistic ideas or strategies to solve whatever the problem was so. yeah I feel like you're talking to me directly because I had a little <laughs> something with my brother yesterday he's you know got a developmental intellectual right. disability and right. yeah he feels like he's not heard often right. and we're his siblings so definitely a different role and he's right. got a different temperament so I, I'm taking a lot of what you're saying to heart here because he'll literally say like you're not listening to me um and yet and we always we... say yes we are listening to you but what they're saying is you're not hearing me you're not yeah understanding to repeat it back yeah. What I hear you saying is this, yeah. or I can tell something that's really like that. frustrating. Usually has to do with his compression socks or something. Like he doesn't want us to look at his legs or like, we don't want to do it either. Right. But we're just doing our job. Well, and that's so. the, thing, the kind of thing where I'd say, you're embarrassed for us to see your legs. Oh, ah. you use the, you've got to, it's got to be a feeling word in there. Something, even if you're, it's wrong, you can guess they're embarrassed. They're frustrated. They're overwhelmed. They're worried. Yeah. You know, embarrassed. Gotta... I've never thought about that. Like well, maybe you just he said is. it though. He's embarrassed for us to see his legs. Yeah. You well, yeah. Said that to me. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so, well, good tips. Good tips. So I, I think that, you know, it, it is a lot of trial and error, right? It's like, well, yeah, that didn't work and let's no, try right. this. 
thing and and your counseling I'm sure is is definitely coming into play because it is I don't love the term parenting our parents because it feels a little like disrespectful right um but there is a role reversal Reversal. thing that happens here or a change up or a switch up or however you want it the roles change uh and so just yeah how do you describe it well, I was going to say, you know, parenting your parents is like the easiest thing to say because people just can sort of get that. But you're exactly right. You don't, they are adults and they have, they, we need to give them autonomy. However, I can't tell you how many people call me. My mom's acting like a toddler. My yeah. dad's acting like a teenager, right? And so then the skills that you have to use sometimes are different depending on where they are and their, you know, their aging process. I think just parenting your parents is like an easy thing to say that people can kind of get, but I totally agree. It's not, it's not without, it should be respectful, but you can also set boundaries with them and you yeah. can, um, you, you can do, do a ways. dignity. Do a, yeah, I mean, do a dignity. And it makes sense that people say, oh, they're acting like a, the teenager it's like there a lot of those struggles and it is like a struggle right for not power but uh managing expectations a lot of it's around safety but independence you're you're independent you're talking about independence a teenager wants to be independent so do our aging loved ones but they don't always make safe choices exactly (laughs) yes yes so where the that's where um the idea of understanding the development of the aging population, because those things, their, their abilities do flip, right? They it flips where some of the things that they are doing, you know, they kind of, if you think about like a bell curve, you know, there are these functioning adults and then they kind of revert back. Yeah. To sort of are you a certified senior, senior advisor? Did you become a... I feel like you're teaching me with some stuff that I learned as a, when I became a CSA, a certified senior yeah, advisor. Yeah, no, yeah. We spend a lot of time talking about that. It's probably taken from some of the stuff mm-hmm. that, you know, um, yeah. social stuff that people learn about um, and being a therapist and a, and a social worker. Uh, but it talks about that quite a, we spend right. a lot of time as a CSA, a certified senior advisor, talking about what that means and understanding right. that aging space, because then you are kind of coming into it with a reference point of understanding right. where they are. And I think also one of the big things I learned is like disease is not synonymous with aging. So we don't have to assume that everybody is going to die from a disease or get a disease. Like that was also like, oh, as an aging right. person myself, getting the, you know, sure. closer, it's comforting, I think, to know that they're, they're not synonymous. Yeah. And to your point, um, as a licensed therapist, I have to do CEUs. Yeah. So most of my CEUs, you know, are in that, in this aging population arena, you know, I kind of shift depending on what my area of interest is, depending on what my CEUs are. It's so good though. It's it's really good to to understand all of that. Um, you know, you had also said that you had to work on your personal composure oh, so that you could be yeah. present and calm yeah. and yeah. clear. Like, how did that happen? Because sometimes it is like, I, these are emotional times and frustrating times. Like, what does right. that look like? Well, I think for me, without, you know, going through my, you know, this whole, my whole life's journey, um, let's just say there was some complexities between myself and my parents some dysfunction of you know years of sort of different ideas about things right so fast forward and I'm an adult and I live my own life and now I'm which they don't really have a say anymore in what I do and how I behave and whatever now all of a sudden I'm thrown back into this role with my parents and sometimes I felt like oh my gosh am I like 10 I act, I'm acting like a 10 year old with my parents. And so um, I used to joke that there were two voices. There was the one on the inside that was like, you kidding me? What? And then there's the one that actually spoke. <laughs> that was the grown up, right? The one with the skills that knew how to talk to them. But I mean, one of the thing was I had my own therapist and I saw her, um, and I know you're going to ask about self-care later, but I saw my the therapist once a week, once a month 
to sort of just where did my past, you know, my upbringing and my relationship with my parents as a child crash into my relationship with them as an adult who is now their caretaker. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so some days that wasn't very clear, but I I was pretty good at it by the time um, I think it was harder when I was working with my mother around my dad, because like you're saying, I was having to do so much mediating and kind of dealing with dad's temperament and mom's temperament and them together. Right? Yeah. You feel like a marriage counselor oh, at some point. Yes. Uh, their child. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was, it was tricky. And then once, once I was just caring for mom, it, it was a little better because she was consistent. So I knew pretty much how she was going to respond and react. So I could, I knew when I needed to really fill up my bucket um, to tend to her address. Yeah, things, that's know. a good point. You So you basically kind of almost anticipate certain situations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I did some of that too. Like I had to be in a certain frame of mind before I would pick up the phone to call or show up, you know, it, for a visit um, and could anticipate some of the things that maybe we were going to talk about. So that you can kind of be prepared if you need to set some boundaries. Yes. And that reminds me, my mother would, she would go to the doctor and later in her life, I started going with her. And this is a me thing. This was not a her thing, but she would start, well, when I was four years old and I'd be like, oh my God, are we going to go through 80 years of issues? And that just for some reason irked me so much. Well, yeah, it's she- excuse mentality. Like that's <laughs> probably why it's why it irked me. I used to have a name for it for my mom. I called it her greatest hits album. Oh, I didn't really say funny. that to her face, but no, again, my- that inside voice, voice yeah. I was like, oh, here we go. Track one, track right. two. Like right. I could anticipate even the next one. And sometimes then it, those were some boundaries I had to set and be like, right hold on a second, you know, we're, we're going to focus on right here now and the next step, like, yeah, especially if it was just me, like, I don't need to hear your greatest hits. Yeah. Sometimes it was me and the doctors were pretty good about, I just said, I don't have to control this. Like the doctors were were pretty good about, they listened to her and then you could tell when they were like asking a question to sort of get her back on track. So then I was like, I don't have to micromanage this, right? The, mm. the, this, the physician can do that. But it just, I was like, oh, here we go again. But anyway. That's- I know, I know. There, But ba- the boundaries is, we have a, you know, there are some other shows where we've talked a lot about boundaries. So boundaries, I'll link, right. link to those as, as well, especially when you're ta- dealing with somebody who's not necessarily a nice person to deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's I, a, there's kind of a hierarchy to me a little bit. There's like all these sort of different parts, right? You need to understand the aging, you know, stages of aging. You need to understand their temperament. You need to tr- sort of maintain autonomy for them and let them be as independent as possible. But then there's, there's safety issues where you have to set boundaries. So like with my mom, cause I was always, there's so many times I was unsure about what to do. And so I, I'd ask myself, did I, was it questions or I'd remind myself, I, my job is to make sure she's financially safe, mentally safe and physically safe. So if I ever had to make a decision about setting a limit or giving her choices or not giving her choices, I would sort of ref, go back to that. And so if I had to be the bad guy and set a limit with her, I felt confident in what I was doing because I was protecting her financial well-being or mental well-being or physical well-being. And so that just gave me a little bit of strength um, of knowing Mm. it's kind of like parenting little kids. Sometimes you have to make hard choices and and make set hard limits and they don't like it, but you're doing it for their well-being. And that that was helpful for me to. I like that. I like that. It's it. easy to remember and something that people can do. You know, I I think we have found too in cases of sometimes with our aging parents and sometimes even with our brother is using third parties to kind of be the bad guy Mm -hmm. or bad lady or bad person. Like not, not bad. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like give the bad news. I I know that's just, yeah. Deliver the bad news, but it could be doctors or, yeah, we just had to do this recently with my brother. He's had a series of automobile accidents. And so he's neurodivergent. So we're like, well, maybe there's something going on and he's not 
capable of driving anymore. And so we've had to go through a third party that we initiated to say, is this person safe to drive? Um, and, you know, and for his pr purposes, we had to tell him it was required by right. insurance. Um, yeah. And in a way it is because his insurance was going to go up and, yeah. and all of that. But he turns out he's safe shady. to drive. It yeah, feels it, shady, but you're do, you're shady. doing it for your three reasons. Yeah. It's like, yeah. and we wanted we didn't want to be liable, you know, right. and we just had to check. So I think no, it doesn't I, hurt. I totally, and that comes back to something that you know I feel like I'm preaching to the choir with you, but the importance of having your village, having your people, because sometimes you, they'll listen to other people better than they will you, right? Mm -hmm. And so in your case, you were talking about the doctors, and then. And sometimes you have to sort of do things like this is required and it just, you know, maybe that's stretching the truth a little bit, but sometimes you have to um, get them where you need them to be to make sure that they're safe, whatever that safety is, whether it's physical safety or financial safety or emotional, mental safety. So it's, yeah, that's why, that's why that helped me because sometimes it felt a little icky you know, have to set boundaries with them because they're grown ups, right? And they're, mm -hmm. anyway, it's hard. It's very yeah. hard. Mm -hmm. um, well, you have a process that you, that helped you during caregiving. You call it your journal log. Tell us more about why this journal log was beneficial for you. Well, there was a few things. Um, I would say I did this more with my mother than my father. Um, because there were a lot of extenuating circumstances um, with some family members and some um, financial, um, oh, like not scams, but just people taking advantage of her a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, and then there were so many different doctors because she, before I got involved, mom had like financial stuff all over the place she had medical doctors all over the place and so it wasn't cohesive and so I might have this doctor that I need to talk to or this financial person that I need to talk to and it just and at the time I was working full-time and my boys were still home so I had a lot and it was a lot to remember so I would always I would just kind of just make notes every day and keep up with stuff you know mom's mood but then things like where had I been? And then, you know, where I need to look at this, who, what doctors did I see? What things did she tell them? And eventually I got her on the same platform of doctors. So I could go into a portal mm. and I could sort of look at everything. But, um, there were a lot of, uh, extenuating circumstances where I had to set limits. And so I kept a record of that. So if my siblings came back and was like, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Um, then I, I didn't have to just rely on my memory because it was super stressful. I was, I felt like I was fighting all the time between being composed and doing the work, right? It was like this constant sort of push pull for me. It's a good way to describe it. Yeah, it, it is. And everybody's got opinions, right? And, but if they're oh. not in the arena with you, like doing the day to day, yep. And that's you kind know, of what it, yeah, that was a little bit what it was like. Yeah. So. You don't get to, they don't get as much weight on that. And you, I do think that as caregivers, you know, we often, we look back and, oh, maybe I would have done that differently, but the journal log helped you say like, you made the best decision with the information yeah, that you had at the time. Yes. I, I, it was really helpful for me and it got it out of my head. If that makes any sense. Like it just, oh, it makes, to I'm a journaler. So it makes sense to me. Yeah, like, it was just like, I call I'm it parking your mental traffic, like yes. it just getting it. Like, okay, you, you live here yeah. now, get out yeah. of my head. Get it out of yeah. my head. Absolutely. Busy brain to busy brain. Get it out on paper. Yeah, I get that. So, and it was helpful. And I had to refer back to it sometimes because they'd say, you know, just, I don't know, lots of questions and I couldn't always recall the details. So I yeah, you mentioned the finances, like being a little bit all over the place. And I know, yeah. you know, with some folks that I've coached, I had to kind of um, I don't have all the answers, you know, but I can point them in, into yeah. a, a certain yeah. direction. Yeah. But what helped you kind of wrangle all that together? Was there a tool that you use? Was oh. it a system? Was it a person? Um, I did it myself. Um, this is not really a trick question. I'm having to think back. Where's my journal? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, she, she had a lot of stuff at the bank. And at this one bank, but she had it in these different pockets. 
So the first thing I had to do, and this was one of those things I had to treat with sort of kid gloves, was to get my name on her accounts. And that I had to like do that delicately because she wasn't quite ready, which was because she was hiding stuff from us. She was Mm. hiding stuff from me. She was spending her money on some stuff that, you know, helping out quote unquote um, family members. And they were, she was being taken advantage of. So she was hiding some of that from me. So I had to, I had to do it in sort of a kind of a um, systematic way. So the first thing I did was I got her on my, uh, or I got her to put me on her accounts. And then the next thing that I did was I was able to get the power of attorney. And again, it just talking about it out loud, it sounds like I was being so secretive and, you know. It's hard but, though. They're, I, they're I, yeah, used to not. Dance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I have heard different things about the putting yep. your name on the accounts. Like I know yep. it can make it easier for us, but sometimes I've heard that it can also make us liable for some of their expenses. Yep. So definitely check yes. with your financial yep. person. Well, that's on what, that. that was the next thing that I was going to say. And then it was like, okay, where do I, you know, I'm doing this because in my mind, I was protecting her financial safety, right? Because she's being taken advantage of it. And then my husband, I think was actually like, but hold up, how does this now you're exposed. How yes. does this expose us? And so then- well, and it, maybe they could. It also, I think, could be a disadvantage for Medicaid. And this is where, like, again, not my not my arena. Right. But if they ever are applying for that, um, but the power of attorney, nobody's going to argue with that. That's um, yeah, yeah. And it was, and it worked out. I mean, it worked out because then eventually she got to where she couldn't pay her bills anyway. So you know, then I was able to do some of that. But you're, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, I think, one of the challenges about talking about this work that we do is that every family's circumstances are so different, right? right? You know, some people live three states away. Some people live with, some people, their financial circumstances are different. And a lot of stuff can be done online, like where we Mm -hmm. don't have to, it's us doing it, but nobody would know, you know, right? Like there's not, nobody's videoing who's entering the password and putting the information in, but well, good, good stuff there. Now you're developing a program. Mm -hmm. um, I think you call it 180 when parental roles reverse for adult children of aging parents. Tell us about the program. Give give us some more information about it. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's already developed. I'm getting ready to put it out into the universe here this spring, you know, (laughs) But it's going to be, um, I've talked to so many people and what the, what it'll be is a series of modules where they get some information, but then we'll come together and it'll be like a group program. And so then we'll meet um, once a week to sort of, for people to compare notes, for me to sort of facilitate um, and elaborate on some of the information that I've given them because of just what I said, there's so many nuances between that. Mm -hmm. And this was just something that it was, I never expected to go down this road, but after, um, caring for my parents in real, and then some of my clients started talking about their aging parents, I was like, people really need support in this area. And some people only need to do a Google search, but some people need, a little more nuanced information. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I've got some free things available and, you know, the blogs and all of those things available for information, but I really wanted to have a little more of a touch um, for people. It's a good way. I mean, because there are nuances in every situation. And I know maybe some people can get it from a Google search, but I know I couldn't even, I didn't even know what terms to Google at half the time. So Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really good that you give them some education, some practical stuff, but then, then you have those conversations with them to figure out, okay, what, how did that work? What worked about? What did it, you know, yeah. How- and then I think too, some of the stuff that we do online is just so limited. Like I just released a blog about the sense of touch and proprioception, right? Well, you know, how long can a blog be and how much can you really explain, you know, in your social media, you know, post or whatever, but yeah. if I can have a conversation with people about it, then we can really expand on it and we can really talk about their circumstances and what it looks like in their world for their parents. So, and then I think it's always nice to be able to talk to other people that are in the trenches with you. Mm-hmm. you know, there's people who are empathic and, you know, they, they get it, but if they're not doing it, it's just, it's just another level. So, yeah. Well, and sometimes you don't even know that you needed 
something until you hear somebody yeah. else bring it up. And, Absolutely. and I think that's the power mm -hmm. of having these connections, um, yes. in, in a group or what, whatever, seeking it out, um, and seek it before you think you really need it because maybe yeah. you could prevent something from happening. I know I would love that. You know, we always talk about, you know, being proactive rather than reactive, but, but and some people do that, but my experience is that, that you know, most of us kick the can down the road. And yes. We just I, it's, I mean, it. that's my experience too. Yeah. And I, and yet we know from having been there that we could have maybe saved some people, some, yes. some frustration and some struggle. Yes. But it is hard. It's still hard to change that narrative. But maybe somebody's listening today and is like, oh, I don't need that. It's like, but how do you know if you haven't right. just go to one, just go to yeah. a, some kind of a support. There's a lot of options. There are. You know, you can work with coaches. You can work yep. with counselors and therapists like yep. Edla, uh, coaches like myself. You can, yep. um, you can, maybe it's with your employee resource group. Maybe it's, we're starting up a adult children of aging parents group yep. in our county in Atlanta. And there's some of those, there's some in North Carolina, actually, ACAP, yep. yeah. adult mm -hmm. children age, yep. of aging parents. Um, there's the daughterhood circles, yes, which circles. meet, um, virtually. So there are a lot of options for people, but I think if you have never been to one, uh, don't knock it till you try it. And right. why not just try it? Like, what if, it, what I if agree. your life could be 180% better, better yeah. to your point? Like, but it's, it's, it's kind of like, I would say nine times out of 10, something happens, you know, there's some, there's oh, a some event. Well, and it can maybe it can be a crisis, but it might not, you know, it doesn't have to be a major crisis, but something happens or they notice something. They're like, wait, what's going on here? You know, when, yeah, so hopefully people will reach out. I mean, there, there's a lot of us out there that are maybe not a lot, but enough of us out there that yeah. are trying to give a little more, um, opportunities and options and having more conversations. And, and I think it's really important. I, you know, I can't quote the statistics. You might know the statistics, but the number of people that are going to be living over a hundred in the next like 20 years, it's, it's astronomical. Yeah. I, I, I feel like it, I read a, a, a statistic somewhere, but I don't want to misquote it. Well, it, it I just shocked. read for the longest time we were saying 10,000 people every day are turning age 65. Um, but I just saw AARP magazine that I get um, yep. that it said 12,000 a day. So it's already gone up by 2,000 a day that are just turning well, yeah, 65. But think, yeah, but you think 65 is pretty young. It's, it is young. It's what I want to know the statistics for the people turning 85, turning 95, and 100. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're definitely different levels of, of yes. aging. Um, and, you know, maybe we can, we can, search for that and, and yeah find that's that. another that's another podcast yeah it, it is it's uh but the 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 point of that is with both of those statistics whatever the 185 and up yeah. one is is that they are going to need help and assistance with things right. even even if it's not synonymous with disease there is a natural yeah. aging process and things right. that happen and helping them to not be isolated and and those things too um and just to have, you know, an eye on, on things so that right. there's so many scammers out there. They're just horrible oh, people that are terrible. taking advantage of people. And sometimes it is the people that we even know that they know. Uh, they're so convincing at it. I mean, they're, it's so convincing. I mean, even I, sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, is that. I was just thinking kid? about that today. Like all the people that I know in my circle that have mm -hmm. been scammed in some way. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been people that I never thought would ever be at risk. Yeah. The um, good at it. They're good. They're good. They're good at it. They make a living doing that. So I think, um, can I, can I say yeah. one quick thing sure. before we get off on another topic, you were mentioning the statistics for 65 year olds. And then I jumped up to the 85 year olds. That's one thing that I rarely talk about, um, with clients, whether it's in group or one-on-one -on -one, is their chronological age. Yes. Because to your point, you know, a 65 year old, you can line up 10, 65 year olds. And some of them are really elderly. And some of them are like, could run circles around a 40 year old. Right. And I think yeah. the same thing is true for 80 or 90 or absolutely. I just played circle. pickleball the other night. There was an 83 yeah. year old woman. I was like, that is, those yeah. are goals right there for me. Yes. yes. And that, and so I don't talk about, you know, there's some generalities of 
aging, but it's also, there's other factors dependent on that. So, yeah. Functional um, age, chronological with, age. Yep. I mean, I don't, yep. I know I learned this yep. too. And I'm like, what is it? Um, work, I'm working with a client now and her mother's like 68 or nine, but she's really aging. I mean, she's, she's having a lot of challenges and they're not, she doesn't have disease. There's a lot of other factors, but yeah. Yeah. She's already struggling and you know, she's not that old. I mean, lifestyle Maybe. choices. There's a yep. lot of things yep. that go into the mental health. Um, the, mental health yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know, the goal for uh, hope a lot of us listening are to be well, elderly people, welderly. Yeah. Um, elderly. I, yeah, like I know elderly. it's, yeah. it's a, it's a goal for sure. I mean, I've seen what it looks like to not do that. Yes. Um, you know, you know, I, my situation is a little different in that it was parents yep, making right. lifestyle choices that caught up to them, um, that put us in a position of being needing to care. Yes. And the other thing that I would say is like, you were talking about disease that impacts what it, you know, you can do. So like one of the things you're talking about, the program that I have coming up, you know, the, one of the things, the way that I, you know, sell it or advertise it is it's a, it's appropriate for these people, but one group it's not appropriate for is if your parent has late uh, stages of Alzheimer's or dementia related yeah. things, because you need a specialized skill set for that. Right. It's kind of about neurodivergent people you need a little more specialized skill set for that um, yeah. than you would sort of a typically developing. Um, yes, exactly. Things. Neurotypical, neurodiverse. It, it totally yeah. different. Like it's totally, not. Yeah, it's, you need. Yeah, it's like when I talk to parents who have kids with ADHD. It's like the regular parenting strategies will work, but then you need a few specialized tools, right? Yes, that will support your ADHD child, right? That's, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I want to get your thoughts on the um, some of the self care stuff, and so this is going to ask you some prompts from the Just for You Daily Self Care Journal, Ed Leather. Right, There's right. no no right or wrong here. Um, okay, what what's the, something that we haven't talked about? But what's the most exciting thing happening in your life right now? I have two it's, granddaughters, and I yay. get to feed them two days a week, and they're girls, and I only had boys. So yes, that's my so six, fun. Six what are they into old. right now? Well, they're just babies. So they're babies. Okay. Or, or, or you know, little. So I just yeah. It's oh, what it's what fun great. you have in store for you to do so some fun. fun things. Yes, I love that. That's a big part of your self care. I'm yeah. sure. And that's I a know, different kind of caretaking. Yeah, know? I was gonna say. Like usually, I say it energizes you, but you might be exhausted after well, both, with your group. But oh, that's another good point. You know, you'll hear a lot in our universe about the sandwich generation, but mm -hmm. there's also the double sandwich generation because there are some people that are caring for their grandchildren, and then they have their adult children, and then they have their aging parents aging because parents. people are living so long. So there are some people that are, you know, like I'm helping with my grandchildren, but my parents have passed but if they were still living that would look really different it would look different yes uh -huh. i've heard that called too yeah club sandwich club sandwich double yeah. double stacked double um, stacked, yeah yeah it's so many crazy i would just call mine a sloppy joe frankly i was like this feels just like a sloppy joe sandwich well that's true uh, if you could have one self-care product on a desert island what would you choose oh my god chapstick <laughs> oh too funny are you an addict I think I might be no let me think that was that's just the, I think I've always thought about those people on survivor and you can only bring two things and I'm gonna be like oh my gosh I think I would need my chapstick um wow I think a journal if I could only have one thing I feel like if I had a way to write we'll give you the pen too the pen and the journal oh yeah oh thanks I appreciate that you're welcome that's off the top of my head if I had time to no think it's good it because then you could park all those thoughts that you you know and I'm sure yeah. like oh, yes good good stuff yeah there's some of these so there's you'd be not able to walk so you'd be able to exercise right so you wouldn't have to take anything <laughs> exactly maybe a pen that's also chapstick <laughs> Do you have, like, you sound like you're really good with like being intentional. You talked about that earlier. Like, do you have some kind of a, a positive habit or something that you could incorporate when you're like stopped at a red light or when a TV commercial comes on, like kind of when you just have this like opportunity of just sitting, like what is something that you might do intentionally with that? Um, 
well, I don't know about it at a stoplight, but I guess I can do it at a stoplight too. But at home, I'm more likely to do some stretches like in during the commercials and stuff like, yeah, I, you know, like exercise snacks, you know, like, but even like a head roll, right. Like, even like a head roll or if I'm yeah. sitting in the kitchen, I'm pretty intentional about that because sometimes exercise is hard for me to fit in my day. So if I, um, my daughter-in-law told me about this idea of exercise snacks and I thought, Ooh, I like a snack. <laughs> and so then I was like, yeah, do, do what are some, some of her, what are some exercise? Well, it's I've just the idea of like, if you've only got, like I have a walking pad here in my office and it's like, you know, if I've got five minutes between clients, if I just, or 10 minutes, if I just walk on the walking pad for five or 10 minutes, that's an exercise snack. Right. And so yeah. this, like what you were talking about, sort of self-care, you know, just doing some stretches or um, during those when I have a few minutes. I think that's probably the most intentional thing that I do. Yeah, I think sometimes we can get caught hung up on it being like a big thing, you know, an all or nothing thing. And these little tiny things can like, you know, add up. Well, I think, yeah, and it's not only just physically, but for me, it's exercise really helps with sort of just, you know, angst and worry and all of those things. So For just sure. as much as the physical implication, I think just the worry that goes along with not only being a caretaker, but being a helping professional, you know, it's, um, I think anything that can kind of reduce that or kind of mediate that is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Edla, is there anything that you w wish that we talked about that we didn't or that you want to just say directly to family caregivers that are listening? And then how do people find out more information about you? Well, okay, let's see. Gosh, there's so many things. <laughs> I think I want to reiterate, because I could talk about this for long periods of time, but I think I want to reiterate some a couple of things that you and I talked about. And one of those is don't wait till there's a crisis. You know, if your parents are, you know, if they qualify for Medicare, then it's, you know, you might want to start reading some stuff and investigating some stuff. So I think that, and I think um, the other thing is just start building your village of people that you have around you um, to, to help you with this. And I think also educate yourself about kind of what it means to be a caretaker because some people are like, well, of course I'll do that. And you just do not know what you've signed on for. And so really be um, thoughtful about what it means to be a caretaker, what your strengths are, what the things that are challenging for you. Like I mentioned, I, w I wasn't really into like bathing my parents. That just wasn't something I wanted to do. Some right. people can do that, but that sort of daily care like that, that's just not my personality. And so I would encourage people to just think about what their strengths are and, um, and it's and, okay. And it's, it's okay, okay that, uh, that there aren't your strengths. Like we cannot well, yeah, be good at you, all of the pieces. Yes. Because then you get resentful, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if you're expected to do something, it's just goes so far against what, what you're comfortable with. So yeah, I think those would stuff. be the, the main all good. things that I would share, but yeah, I think well, and ultimately they should just get connected with you, Edla, because you've got oh, more to you. share. Yes, so where where would people find out more information? Um, my website for sure, edlaprevet.com. Um, I have all the things on there. I have a, I call it the 180 bookend technique. It's a workbook. It's complimentary that people can download. And um, it has some really good, it's like three steps. Um with examples okay. and scripts that people can use immediately to increase cooperation and decrease conflict with their parents. So they can get that at the website. Um, yeah. And I'm also on Facebook at 180 with Edla Prevet and that 180 is spelled out. And then I'm on Instagram at 180 underscore Edla Prevet and 180s. And we'll link to out. all of and that. I, yeah. I do some coaching and, you know, I, I have the group program will be coming up this, um, spring and yeah so well good this is coming out very timely then well y'all connect to edla she's been oh, a delight to get to know yeah. so thank you so much edla for coming on the happy healthy caregiver podcast and just You're educating welcome. us more about the things that we can potentially have a little control over when we are right. faced with something that we don't have a lot of control over and that is when our parents need more help from yeah. us yeah yeah thanks so much elizabeth and you have a safe trip <laughs> thank you thank you all right take care